It's good to be together, friends. I'm so grateful um, just, just for your presence, but also just our God is good and faithful always. And so it's good to just gather rec- in recognition of that and then to just receive uh, what he has for us. And I hope that you're doing that. I hope that you came this morning with, with two things in mind. One was to be blessed, and the other was to bless. Um, that's, that's what it means to be a part of his family, is to always be seeking to not just receive, but also to allow him to work in you and through you to bless other people. I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to Job, Job chapter 38. And as well, if you can have Matthew chapter 6 handy, that would be good later on. Job chapter 6, I mean, sorry, Job chapter 38, Matthew chapter 6. And there's a, there's a special day happening this week. I don't know if you know. Somebody has a birthday. Somebody always has a birthday. But this week it's a special birthday. It's this guy's birthday. Woo! How old is that cow? <laughs> the cow is at least a year and a half. Yeah. Uh, Rich is the one on your left. Um, yeah, Rich, Rich has his birthday this week. And, uh, you know, you know, as he's getting older, he's becoming friends with the animals. And I think it's that part, you know, where you're just like, there we go. You just become one with nature. And, and uh, <laughs> I just see Rich getting uh, buddy-buddy with a Scottish Highlander. And this one is, is especially friendly. So uh, soon he'll have a saddle and be riding around. That's what he wants for his birthday is a saddle for the, for the cow. But, um, I, you know, when you, when you know Rich, you know that he has most of what he needs. He doesn't need a lot. But I realized one thing he didn't have was he didn't have, um, he likes honey. And so it's like, well, maybe we get him like a hive of bees so he could have his own honey. And so I bought him a dozen bees, but uh, they gave me 13. I guess it was a freebie. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not bad, right? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Hey. To go from that to this, we're in Job. And, and let me just say, some of you are, are really sick. Because I don't know how many of you told me Job is like your favorite or one of your favorite books in the Bible. And I'm like, <laughs> how is it possibly? I, I really don't enjoy reading through Job. And that sounds horrible for a pastor. I mean, it's one of my 66 favorite books in the Bible, but it's not my favorite by a long shot. But many of you really are drawn to Job. And I know my dad was also drawn to Job. Um, so, so I'm not sure what it is, but it has to do with suffering. And so as we look at suffering, this is part two of Job. If you weren't here last week, we looked into Job part one as to a, a whole lot. It was, it was a long message around really the beginning of it all. What is Job suffering and what does it mean to suffer? So this question that we asked last week, just to reset our minds back in this place to understand, to understand Job, we have to go to this layer of suffering. We have to get there and we have to understand this is what we're talking about. So we have to wrap our heads around that which is difficult at times when you're going from worship and, and emotion and giving, and then to say, well, let's talk about suffering. Uh, but that's where we're at, and it's okay, and, and we should. Um, it might not be something you hear in, in every church across the world today, but there's a lot the Bible has to say about suffering. It has the book of Job, but also has a whole other book called Lamentations, which is all just about grief and, and about suffering through grief. There's not like an entire book that's just about being happy, but there are more than one about suffering. So we should look at it. So what would you say to a friend who lost everything? We asked that question last week. What would you say when they then asked the question, you know, why is God allowing this to happen to me? And I've seen this in my, my 22, almost starting my 23rd year here soon, but the 22 years here at Melba Friends, I've seen that happen where somebody begins to draw near to God and then something goes wrong in their life and they're like, well, it must not be true. And so they walk away as if suffering is the evidence that there is no God or suffering is the evidence that they shouldn't try. So what do you say to somebody when they suffer and then they want to know why? Why is God allowing this to happen to me? And then, then to add that question, have you ever asked those questions? I've asked those questions. Why, why God, am I going through this? And, and if you're close to me, you know what this is and how this is hard. And you look at that and you're like, how in the world do I find Jesus in this suffering and in this grief. But it's really important that we don't shy away from it. It's especially important, church, that we don't give cliches and gloss over it. That is probably the worst thing you can do. They just say, well, everything happens for a reason. I could, I could give you a hundred of those statements. And I wish I was more like Job, because Job just told his friends off when they said stuff like that. But I just smile and nod, yeah, it does. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it's true. It does. Everything happens for a reason. It happens because sometimes suffering is life. There's that statement. I can't remember who said it, but it said, the day I was born, I cried, and every day for the rest of my life proved why. Um, you know, just that sense of suffering, that's really optimistic. You came here this morning saying, man, I want to pick me up. I hope we hear about suffering and crying. Yeah, you're here. You're in the right place. We're talking about people in the Old Testament you should know and how Jesus fulfills their stories. And that's an important part. Their story is good and powerful, but if we're not careful, then we get stuck in stories of behavior and how we need to behave. It's always important that we point to Jesus through every story because Jesus is the redeemer. He is the savior. He's the one that makes sense. And in my life, he's the one that makes sense of suffering even when I don't enjoy suffering, which I never do enjoy suffering. But he's the one that makes sense of suffering, not always in the middle of it, but through it, he makes sense of the story of suffering in my life. And friends, if you're not ready, if you're not experiencing suffering, and you think that all you're going to do is experiencing good, then, then when suffering comes, you're not going to be ready. I was doing premarital counseling with a couple, and I asked them, nope, they're not here, don't worry. And, and I asked them, I said, well, how, how are things going to change when you get married? And they said, like any young so in love, literally what couple said, oh, it's just going to get better and better. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> the young people are like, wait, what? Yeah, that's what they said. And I haven't responded to that yet. I'm going to wait before I pop that bubble. Because it does, it does, it does get better and better. But it's because you learn that life has suffering, and you have to learn how to suffer together. And women, you have to learn to suffer with that choice you made the rest of your life. Yeah, there's suffering that goes into marriage, but there's also this aspect of work and, and aspects of all those things. So when we look at suffering, we look at reality. I shouldn't talk about marriage and suffering hand in hand, but you get there. Let's recap where we were. Job suffered. He had lots. He had everything you could imagine that you would want. He had it all, and he was suffering from immense loss and pain. He lost it all, and then he lost his health. He was suffering from head to toe. He's covered in sores, all this stuff. It's just, it's just he is absolutely, completely miserable. He has three friends, the three amigos. They assume that it is because Job has sinned, that this is why he's suffering. Job is, you, you've sinned, and God's punishing you. That's why you're suffering. Have you ever felt like you've, you're experiencing something bad and it's because you did something wrong and God is out to get you? Yeah, you have. you felt that. I have. I'm sure you have. So his three friends say that. Job mocks his friends, saying, you guys are truly the sun rises and sets on your wisdom. Um, you know, if they're poor help. But then he mourns his pain and he describes his agony. It's hard to read. And again, I don't understand you guys who love Job because reading about somebody's pain isn't my cup of tea, but here it is. <coughs> that was random, but it worked. Um, and, and so Job mocks his friends, mourns his pain, and then he asks God, basically, meet with me. Talk with me. Let's, let's settle this. Let's not duke this out, per se. But he's saying, God, come and answer me and tell me what I've done wrong. Help me to understand. Why is your hand against me? Why are your arrows in me? And why is my body drinking the poison of your arrows? Now, that's what the perspective is of them. But we know something different. The reader knows what? That Job's suffering is a result of Satan. And would you read the underlying part with me? Claiming Job's faith is only based on his prosperity. That would never happen. Where you would only believe in God when things are going well for you, right? But they, but we, we know that, that that's what Satan's saying. Satan's saying, the only reason Job's loved you, God, is because you've blessed him. You've given him his heart's desire. You've given him health. You've given him family. You've given him wealth. Everything that Job could possibly want, you've blessed him with. And so God says, okay, take it away. Let's see if his faith is indeed genuine. Let's see if his faith is genuine even when he loses his health. So God allows, and that's a huge word, God allows. Cause and allow are two different words. He allows the testing of Job's faith through these trials to prove that indeed Job's faith, which is more important to God than anything, Job's faith is more important to God than anything, is indeed, that it is indeed genuine and not as praiseworthy. So God allows this horrid set of tests to strip Job of all the blessings to see, does he still believe? Does he still love? You put yourself in those shoes for a second, 
How would you stand if you lost everything? Your family, your wealth, your land, anything and everything. All your servants who do all your chores. If you lost all them, can you imagine how hard life would be? Yeah. You lost everything and you lost your health and you're covered in sores from head to toe. You're completely miserable. You can't sleep because you're just tormented and terrorists sweep over you. Would you still love God? So part one was Job's suffering. Part two is God's answer. So we look at God's answer, and this is, this is where Job, I think this is why you guys like Job, because of the last three or four chapters. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you really are. Maybe there really something is wrong with you. But, but when you suffer something, let me ask you this. What do you assume is happening? So let's, let's throw out a completely, this is a completely random situation, scenario, making it up on the fly. No basis of reality, right? Imagine with me, you're going to go to bed, right? So the lights are out. You know the way to your side of the bed. This is completely random. Imagine as you're going in the dark to your side of the bed, you trip on a box of boots. A box that's like about this size that is ex completely random. Completely random. Complete, that is exactly in your walking path. And there was no way that you would not run into that box of boots if it was not there. What would you assume happened? If that, if that random event happened to you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it did happen. Uh, when you suffer, what do you, why do you, what, what do you assume about that suffering? Let's say, let's say you stub your toe. Why did that happen? You can answer. This is not rhetorical. You don't pay attention? Okay. Let's, let's, say, let's say you get sick and you suffer for two weeks with a bad cold. Why did that happen? Why are you suffering? You're mumbling, it's okay to talk out loud. And, okay. okay. What do you assume about God's role in that? Do you assume that God has a role in your sickness, in your stubbing toes, or only in your major catastrophes? In cancer, health loss, job loss. When you suffer, where is God in your list of assumptions? Is he the causer? Is he the allower? Is he not present at all? <laughs> is he micromanaging it? Is he causing it? Those are really important questions because as we read Job, we look at assumptions. Everyone has assumptions about why things happen the way they do. And everybody has assumptions about God, who he is or who God isn't, and what God does or what God does not do. And I think Job thrusts us right into that argument of who is God, where is God, when I'm suffering, what role does he play? And these assumptions are lived out. You live out your assumptions about God all the time. You don't, you're not conscious of it, but your faith is evident by what you do. So when you do things because you believe there is a God, that, that becomes evident. Or you believe certain things that God does that, that you also live out. And these are understanding assumption moments. So Job's friends had assumptions, right? We have these three friends. We have Eliphaz, we have Bildad, and we have Zophar, and, um, and so together they are fantastic, they're great friends initially, but they're not the best. People of that day assumed about God these things. They believed that there were gods, plural. And they believed these gods controlled certain aspects of life. There's the God of fertility, which we won't go into explanation about. There are gods of crops, of rain, weather, Gods of prosperity. There were, uh, what else was it? There's the, the God of the cell signal. There's the God of the car starting or not. Um, and, and there's the God of sports teams. And people believed in these gods, not us. People believed in these gods, and you could pray to that God, and you could do certain things of acts of attribution or blessing to that God, and you could do that to this statue thing that was representative of that God. And if you prayed right, and you prayed well, if you acted right and well, you would be blessed. You would get what you wanted. But if you didn't, if you did something wrong, then the opposite was true, you'd be cursed. Okay, this is idol worship. And it was common to the core back then, not today. Maybe it is. <clears throat> when I think of idol worship, I prefer to use this picture. Um, 
you have you have like you have each person, each god had different roles and different represent. You had like the god of logic. You had I like I like the Star Trek thing, and the kids are like, I remember that painting. Um, yeah, no, there's you had you had like the god of health. You had the god of, of success. You had the god of victory. You had the god of understanding. You had all these different gods, and you served them and you worshipped them in order to do that. And so this assumption was throughout society. Now Job's friends are similar but a little different. They believed in one god. They believe that the God rewards good behavior and punishes bad behavior, which is totally different than what everybody else believed about their gods, right? They believe that suffering exists because of bad behavior, whether it was external or internal, which is not at all like the idol worship, or is it? They believe that repenting and doing things God's way could fix the situation. Do you see the similarities? They had one God rather than the idols. But their assumptions about God blended way too close with that of the idols. Because God is so much different. We're going to see that in just a minute. The assumptions of Job, on the other hand, are even a little bit more different. Job believed that there was one God. They believed that he was all-knowing. But Job didn't believe that God always blesses the righteous and that he doesn't always curse the wicked. And he said, you and I know, Bobby, over there, running, running amok. He, he is blessed beyond belief, even though he hasn't believed in God. If Job could speak to God, this is another assumption, if Job could speak with God, there would be clarity, and suffering would either be explained. In other words, Job believed that there was a misunderstanding between him and God. So even though he believed God was all-knowing, he believed there was a misunderstanding between him and God. And Job also believed that God can act against you without reason. That's a big one. How do we know that one? Oh, well, let's, let's look at Job, chapter 3, verse 24 through 26. Job says it point blank. This is right after all the suffering has come on him. This is one of the first things he says. And would you read it with me when we get to the highlighted part? I cannot eat for sighing. My groans pour out like water. What I always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come true. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest. Only trouble comes. Job believed in God, but he was afraid that God was just a little bit wild and that for some time and some possible reason, God might turn against him without reason. And he had this fear, even though as he had all this success, there might come a day when God takes it all away. So when God enters the story of Job again, and we're going to be looking at Job chapter 38 and 39 in just a moment. Don't worry, I'm not going to read it. We're going to watch it. We're going to listen to it. When God enters the story again, after a fourth friend, Elihu, Elihu is a very, very interesting person in Job's story. He is not rebuked by God at the end, not to be a spoiler. And, and yet everything he says, Job doesn't respond to. And everything he says begins to build this climax towards what God says. So we believe, some people believe, not everybody, believe that Elihu was actually God's messenger to Job, preparing the way for God to speak. And this fourth friend speaks this wisdom. And then things happen. God shows up and it doesn't happen like you might think. It doesn't happen how I want the story to happen. Because for my, my opinion of Job's story, let me ask you this. If you're suffering and you, and you talk to Jesus and Jesus shows up and he enters into the story of your suffering, what do you want him to do? You want to fix it, right? Right. You want it to look like this. Let's read this. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 51. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Shouting, not, not whispering, not, not speaking. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. What did he do? But he shouted all the more. Would you shout with me? Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and he said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Sounds like the friends. Hey, you tried hard enough, God's gonna help you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. And Jesus asked this question, which I, I wonder if it's one of the more ridiculous questions, but it's an important question. Jesus asked a blind man, what do you want me to do for you? 
Jesus asked him. And the blind man said what? Rabbi, I want to see. If you read the rest of the story, you see that indeed he does see. What do you want Jesus to do for you this morning? When God shows up in the story of Job, we kind of want it to go that way. We want God to show up and we want God to stop the suffering. We want it to, we want it to end. We, we hope that after all the suffering, God would show up, he would sweep in, he would rescue Job, he would restore Job, and he would give the devil a really good beat down for having a terrible idea, right? 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 That's what you want. When I'm suffering and at the end, I want to be like this. Yeah, you, you, you not only rescued me, but you, you kicked Satan's rear all over the place for all the torment he put me through. Right? Oh, come on. One person? Yeah, right. So what does Job do? And what does God do in Job's case? Not that. Not that at all. And you guys like this story. He doesn't show up. He doesn't rescue Job like you expect. He does something entirely different. God doesn't come in and put Job in his arms and say, you did so well, my good and faithful servant. You endured this suffering. I'm so sorry it happened. He doesn't do that at all. God addresses the heart behind Job's questions and doubts. Because all throughout this book, Job is spewing questions and doubts and saying, God, you need to call, you need to answer me, you need to speak to me, even in Job's faith. And it's not a sin to call out to Job and say, I think you're doing wrong, and I want to talk to you about this. That's not a sin. Then the Lord this is what God says. answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds and garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far you shall come and no farther and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began? and caused the dawn to know its place? Though it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it, it is changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment. From their wicked their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare. If you know all this, where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness, that you may take it to its territory, and that you may discern the paths to its home? You know, for you are born then, and the number of your days is great. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow, or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed? or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain, and a way for the thunderbolt, to bring rain on a land where no man is, on the desert in which there is no man, to satisfy the waste and desolate land, and to make the ground sprout with grass? Has the rain a father, or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come from, and who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades, or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Mazareth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds, that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, Here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds of wisdom? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clods stick fast together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion? 
or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth, when they crouch, bring forth their offspring, and are delivered of their young? Their young ones become strong, they grow up in the open, they go out and do not return to them. Who has let the wild donkey go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkey to whom I have given the arid plain for his home? It goes on, but it froze, so we'll stop there. It continues on with questions for Job, and, and then we see that in Job's suffering, God, uh, Job does what we often do. He does what even the church often does. And this is, this is a part where I think it needs to settle in with us as we listen to God's words and what he was doing. Job allows his difficulty, his suffering, he allows it to diminish his view of the Almighty. Does that make sense? He downsizes God. And, and from my experience, this is, this is what suffering does to us. It, it causes the suffering, it begins to seem larger than, than God. The greatness of Job's suffering seemed to him, it, it, it let him minimize the greatness of his God. And so as Job is crying out over and over again and, and demanding that God speak to him, he is realizing this point where, where his suffering is so great, and he doesn't realize it in the moment, but then when God speaks, he does see that he treated him just like, like he would any other person. So suffering can make me, and I, this is speaking personally, friends, I, I'm your pastor, but I'm not immune to struggle, right? It'd be terrible if I was. No, it wouldn't. It'd be fine. <laughs> Suffering can make me think of God in small terms. As if he owes me. As if I deserve certain things from him. Or as if God should do what I think. And that's probably just me. You probably don't struggle with Suffering has this way of revealing this part of us in this battle with God as to what is really going on. And if you look closely into that behavior, it looks an awful lot like this, right? God, I did such and such, and therefore you were supposed to do such and such. I didn't do these things, so I do not deserve these responses. But as Job finds out, God is way bigger than those patterns. And, and in fact, God is pretty wild. If you don't believe that, just look at our planet. And look at the diversity. And look how dangerous our planet can be. Job's complaints, they, they downsize God. And so God's response is to set the record straight. So God speaks out of this whirlwind and he begins to speak about the foundations of the planet and the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars. He talks about all of this and he says, explain it to me. Which isn't it interesting how hard we try to. And we keep coming up short with explanations about why we live on such a privileged, beautiful, wonderful planet. And he talks about the expanses of the earth and the creation and the ocean and the light and the dawn, about life and all of its beauty, about snow, about weather, about death. He talks about the power of the sun and just light in general. He talks about all this. And again, he talks about snow. And, and as, um, as Jared pointed out when we were looking at this, he says, he talks a lot about animals. He talks a lot about creation. Talks a lot about all these things he's made, but he spends a lot of time talking about animals. And it's like, as fascinating as the stars are, aren't you dumbfounded by how I created things like this? This? We take it for granted, don't we? We, we just go with it and we think, okay, well, yeah, we see it, we're used to it, it makes sense to us, but does it? The fact that that exists, 
The fact that it's there, the fact that it has the strength that it does, the movement that it does, everything. And we try and we try and we try as humanity to explain it in all of our intelligence. And we end up looking more like this. All right? I love how God has a sense of humor and he mocks his own creation in the ostrich, saying it didn't get its fair share of sense. <laughs> Then he goes on and talks about the horse and the horse going into battle and the strength and the flight of the hawk and the eagle and all these things that he says. Then he talks about something else. He talks about the behemoth. And we don't know what the behemoth is. We know that it is a mighty creature. It sure sounds like a brontosaurus. It does. And then it talks about Leviathan. That sure sounds like a dragon. But we'll say it's a whale. Or a crocodile. That makes more sense. A fire-breathing crocodile. But God explains all these things and says, tell me how they came to be and explain to me the complexity of them and the difference of them. In the end, Job is speechless. He's speechless, and this is what he says. Uh, Job answered the Lord. Would you read his words with me? And I, I don't want us to read it. I, I want us to mean it. So he says, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. What's interesting about this is that Job has not been relieved of his suffering yet. He still has lost everything. He still has sores from head to toe. He still has complete agony physically and emotionally in every way, and yet he does not get what he wants, and he says, I don't have anything else to say, God. Why not? What's your opinion? Why, why, why does Job not address this up? And God is there. And God gives him an opportunity to speak. And Job says, no, I spoke, but I'm not saying anything else. Why not? It's because when he came face to face with the God of the universe, he realized he was so very small and his suffering was so very insignificant. Job goes on. He replied to the Lord later, says, I know that you can do all things. Let's say that. I know, God, that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears, in verse 5, if you hear anything, friends, this morning, please hear this. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Why is Job repenting? He's suffering. He's lost everything. And he blamed God, and yet God shows up, and all God does is talk about everything that he's done. And Job is left repenting. Why? Because when you come face to face with the mighty, powerful wonder of God, Everything else doesn't matter. Job's friends assume that God blesses the righteous, right? Remember this over and over again. That God blesses the righteous and the evil are cursed. They weren't wrong. Their focus was on worldly temporary blessings and their timeline was way too short. We know that God does bless the righteous and we do know that those who are wicked are headed to destruction. We know that. But we often focus on this really, really tiny timeline. God's timeline is so very different. And we see this in 2 Corinthians when it talks about suffering. And if you're suffering this morning, friends, and there's something going on in your life that you do not understand, then listen to this and don't take it as something to gloss over your suffering. Take it as something to propel you into the presence of God. It says, therefore, and let's read it together, therefore we do not lose heart because, friends, when you are suffering, you are tempted to lose heart. That means you're tempted to give up. You're tempted to walk away. You're tempted to say, why do I even try? Right? But it says we don't lose heart. Why? Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Why does Job not complain to God after God reveals himself to him? Because Job beheld the one that was more worthy than anything he could ever have. 
And he says, my light, Paul is saying, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes. And, he's like, and I hate that he says light and momentary troubles because when you're in the midst of trouble, it does not feel light and it does not feel momentary, does it? But they are light and they are momentary compared to the glory that is to come. So we what? Verse 18, read it. Let's believe it. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Have you seen God? No. Have you seen the wonder of his hands? Have you through suffering, have I through suffering, or even just over-familiarity, or even just plain ignorance. All those are true for me. Been downsizing the creator of the universe to somebody a little bit more my size. I know in my suffering, the biggest struggle I face is remembering and believing and walking with a God who created the entire universe like that. Do I treat God as one who must serve and answer me? So maybe this is why you weirdos like Job. It's because it reminds you that God is the God of the universe and that your suffering is only temporary. And compared to the unbelievable glory and unending glory of God, your suffering is really light and momentary. This is something we hear in Jesus too. Jesus says this to us. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. You could say, do not worry about your suffering. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? And let's read verse 26. God has a thing with helping us understand points by looking at created things, especially the animal kingdom. He says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Did I tell you not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these? If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear for the pagans? Run after all these things. Remember the pagans? There's those people with those statue gods. No. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, seek the God who created it all. And everything else will begin to make sense. So what do we do? How do we walk out of this? This is the middle part of looking at Job. Part one, don't let your suffering take your eyes off your Savior. That's hard. It takes intentionality. It says, I'm suffering right now, but I'm going to look at the one who intentionally suffered even worse for me. Scripture tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus who suffered for us. So that's part. So what can I do to grow? How can I get to this point where when I'm in my suffering, I remember the God who did all these things that we just read and heard in Job? Well, the simple word is behold. Behold the work of God. I'm pretty sure all of us still have, I'm looking around, both our eyes. Yeah. I didn't want to offend anybody, Lauren. Open them. Behold the work of God. Open them and behold the promises of God. Open them and behold the love of God. Behold God, and that can help you. It doesn't make the suffering go away. I'm not promising that. It helps you see the one who was there before the suffering, during the suffering, and well beyond the suffering. Maybe your suffering is lifelong. That's okay. Your life's pretty short. So is mine. Abba, Father, we pray. And your word encourages me to cast all my cares and my worries to you because you love me. So I come to you today with my battles. I want to invite the worship team to come up as we pray this. I bring you my suffering, and I bring you my confusion. God, I bring you my doubts, and I bring you my pain. 
both my external pain, my internal pain. In other words, God, I bring you all of me. Father, I do not want to be calloused like Job's friends to my suffering or to the suffering of others. Help me to act in holy compassion. And if I do speak, let it be with words that can truly heal the heart. Thank you, God, that you care about us so much. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. You know, as preparing this message and, and even working through it with the team, talking about it, and it's like, how do you walk out of something so heavy and then just walk out and be like, hey, that was good? <laughs> Only when you know that the heaviness is temporary. And friends, I hope that as we, as we have this this morning, and I, I, I told Bethany even this morning, I said I'm a little hesitant on the message because I like to wrap things up nice and neat. I try to. I want you to walk away and say, here I go and I have these things that I can take with me. But when we look at something as heavy as suffering, I don't think we should wrap it up nice and neat because that would be a betrayal mm -hmm. to what you're going through. And so if I can just ask really quick, how many of you are suffering something this morning? if you wouldn't be afraid to raise your hand so that others could actually see that they're not the only ones suffering. Yeah. God is able, more than able, to hold you through the suffering until the day that he returns to take you to the place where there is no more suffering. He is able to hold you. He is able to stop the suffering. And sometimes he does. But he's also able to love you through that. And that's the God that I'm going to follow. And I hope that's the God you're going to follow. So we should give that God glory. We should give that God honor and praise. So God, we do. We thank you, God, that, that above all the things that we would face, Lord, that you are mighty and you are awesome. And God, as I think of my own struggles and the struggles of those here, Lord, my friends, my brothers and sisters, the things that they are battling, Lord. But I recognize that I need to stop. And I need to behold the God of all creation, the God of wonders, the God of power, the God who is faithful. And God, I turn to you, God, in, in the midst of this, and I say, would you walk with me in this? And God, if it is your will, as, as Job was hoping, Lord, if it's your will, Lord, would you remove it from us, Lord? But God, don't remove us from your hands. But may it be that your kingdom comes in such a way that we understand the temporary aspect of this life in ways that we never thought we would before. May we be so filled with your Holy Spirit that when trouble and trial and battle comes, that we know the God that it's only light and momentary. And you, God, are eternal and you're awesome, and you're good. Amen, 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 amen. Just stand as you're able. Glory, glory, I've been singing since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, yeah, I've been singing since I laid my burden down. I'm singing hallelujah, God is able, hallelujah, God is faithful, hallelujah, Lord, I'm gonna sing. I feel better, I do so much better than you, since I lay my burden down. If you haven't done it, do it. Yeah, I feel better. So much better since I lay my burden down. I'm singing hallelujah, God is able, hallelujah, God is faithful, hallelujah, Lord, I'm gonna sing. I'm singing hallelujah, God is able, hallelujah, God is faithful, hallelujah. Oh, I'm gonna
dancing even in the pain as long as i'm alive there's gonna be shine because i know that he's gonna win one thing that i know yeah deep down in my soul as long as i'm alive i'm gonna sing why as long as i'm alive there's gonna be praise as long as i'm alive there's gonna be shine